makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter, and here's what's coming up on today's program. The EU launches a probe into Chinese subsidies for electric vehicles as the bloc frets over the ability of its industry to compete. VP boss Bernard Looney quits over his failure to disclose past relationships with colleagues, leaving the oil and gas major leaderless at a crucial time. Plus, the ECB's new forecasts are set to show inflation staying above 3% next year, that's prompting traders to lift to rate hike bets. Well, key U.S. CPI data comes out later today. Also coming up, some pretty big exclusive interviews we'll be bringing you. We'll be in conversation with Jane Hartley, the U.S. ambassador to the U.K., plus the chief executive officer of the Swiss watchmaker, Audemars Piguet, joins me a little bit later on as well. But first thing is first, it's all about the markets, and this is a look at what European markets are telling us. Now, we're also uh, getting a bit of breaking news from the IEA. I'm really looking forward to speaking to Toro Bozzoni uh, shortly. A Saudi oil cuts are threatening a surge in price volatility. This is the th just the latest warning from the IEA. In general, the other big story is, of course, traders lifting some of the bets on ECB rate hikes. Uh, they're worried that inflation will stay over 3% for longer. And then minutes ago, we just had some pretty much uh, news that the EU is hitting China with a probe into some of the EV subsidies as the industry fears are growing over their access to funds and how they can move going forward. We're seeing across the board a lot of the European automakers gaining after that news um, broke. This was according to Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission president, and she announced the probe today saying that the global market is flooded with cheap Chinese cars. Now, two big stories that we're watching, of course, this EU investigation to Chinese subsidies for electric vehicles. Again, and the other story is a shock resignation of BP chief executive after admitting that he failed to fully disclose some past personal, personal relationships. So let's start with Maria Tadeo on the ground for us in Brussels. Maria, I, know, I don't know whether we had an inkling, but certainly this is a huge news, is the EU is now saying, look, there's just too many cheap uh, Chinese companies. We're looking into subsidies. How long does this kind of investigation take? Absolutely, Francine, and I think you nailed it, because this is not just a political announcement that comes in a political speech. This is actually pretty significant in terms of some of the executive action that you could see from the European Union as a trading bloc when it comes to Chinese EVs. Now, the head of the European Commission today announces, as you say, this probe into what she calls her flooded, but also artificially uh, low Chinese subsidies into this particular area of the market, the EVs. Of course, Francine, you know that for many, this is the future of cars, and this is such a crucial, almost strategically crucial sector for Europe. Now, in terms of the length of the investigation, Francine, this is such a technical, complicated market that potentially we're in for months. This is not going to be a weak situation, but just the announcement, just the fact that the Commission is doing this and has decided to tackle on China head on. You see the reaction in European car makers. They're trading higher, but they also respond to a topic that we've had many CEOs, you've had many European CEOs on your shows, all of them saying it's very very tough to yeah. compete. We're facing multiple climate actions. All of the subsidies is complicated. Yeah, it's complicated. And there's a lot of retaliation that has happened in the past. I think just moments ago, and we're not saying this is retaliation, but actually China also said it's noticed some security incidents involving iPhone. So you go after some Chinese companies, you wonder actually the blowback from that. Maria, thank you so much, as always, for some terrific reporting on the ground. Let's also talk BP. Our Will Kennedy, who oversees all of our commodity coverage, has been knee deep into trying to cover the story. I mean, this was, you know, pretty shocking because it happened so fast. So the chief executive exited yesterday yesterday after a surprise announcement. What does it mean for BP's green ambitions going forward? It's a very important question uh, to which there's no immediate answer because BP hasn't been terribly clear on what the succession plan is. They put in the CFO as an interim CEO, uh, but I don't think that that means at all that he's uh, necessarily the, he is a candidate, but the lead candidate. Uh, they will have to make clear how they're going to select a new CEO, whether that's going to be only internally, as they've traditionally done, or whether they'll cast the net uh, more broadly and give some outline about how it will happen. But it's true to say that Bernard uh, Looney's uh, green transition wasn't always popular with all investors. And I think it's clear that uh, this sudden change of leadership will provide an opportunity for some investors to reopen that debate about how fast they go, or whether they should concentrate on oil and gas and returning excess cash to shareholders. 
Well, thank you so much, as always, of course, to you and your team for some great reporting. Will Kennedy in charge of our commodity coverage across the board. Now, let's also uh, talk about oil. We uh, just moments ago heard from the IEA that oil supply cuts by Saudi Arabia and Russia will create a significant supply shortfall and they will threaten a renewed surge in price volatility. So that's according to the International Energy Agency. I'm delighted now to be joined by uh, Toral Bodoni from the IA for an in-depth look at exactly what that means for the oil markets. Toral, as always, thank you so much for joining us. So how much of a threat is it to you know, world markets? Um, is, is Saudi Arabia really now at risk of over-tightening the oil market and therefore damaging the global economy and really hurting consumers across the board? Good morning. Yes, as we write in our reports this month, and it's something that we warned for quite some time, is the marketing, market is really tightening in the second half of the year. Already in August, we saw global oil inventories falling by a massive 75 million barrels, uh, from according to preliminary data. And with the extensions of the cuts by Saudi Arabia, but also Russia through the end of the year, uh, we're seeing demand, global oil demand, overtaking supply by about 1.4 million barrels a day in the fourth quarter. Uh, so this risk, uh, tightening the market, increasing volatility, we saw price volatility at the, at the decade low in August when prices were steady around $85. But the latest cuts, we saw prices shooting past $90. And now, as you see, uh, around 92 for Brent. So this is something that we are concerned about, given the very fragile economic uh, situation that we're in. So, Toro, how much risk do these current prices of oil actually mean for the economy and inflation worldwide? Well, we're looking at, so prices are still lower than they were last year when just in the aftermath of Russia's invasion to Ukraine, but still uh, with interest rates uh, very high and central banks uh, looking at how to ease those higher oil prices, energy prices in general is obviously a key factor into those considerations. So uh, prolonged high prices risk uh, delaying the, the easing of monetary policies, which could put the recovery, the economic uh, situation at risk. Uh, Tora, we've also seen some pretty strong rebound in Iranian production, but some officials indicate that actually they've hit a ceiling. How do you see that panning out? Indeed, one of the so far this year, uh, as, as we note in our report, the output cuts from some of the OPEC countries uh, of 2 million barrels a day uh, have been mitigated by a, by a big increase in Iranian production. Iranian production since the start of the year uh, until August is up by 600,000 barrels a day, which helps offset some of the declines from other OPEC plus producers. Uh, for our balances, our forecast, we have uh, we uh, think that Iran can sustain this level of production if the market is there. So far, we're seeing India quite keen to snap up these discounted barrels. Uh, and we saw then Iranian production increasing to 3.1, 3.2 million barrels a day in August, its highest in five years. So we're, we are not factoring in further increases in Iranian supplies, but it remains to be seen. It, it would depend on the market. Uh, for those barrels. The U.S. Treasury insists that its price cap on Russia is working, but is Russia actually gaining market share? So now, in the latest month, we're seeing Russian exports of around 7 million barrels a day. It's a million barrels below um, the pre-war levels. Um, what we're seeing now, uh, oil prices, Russian oil prices are above the price cap. Uh, so that prevents uh, EU maritime services, G G7 countries, from moving that oil. Um, but exports are holding up. We're still seeing interest uh, from China and India, particularly those two countries taking up more than half of uh, Russian oil exports. Uh, but the share has declined uh, in recent months. Uh, as the prices are now higher and the, the discounts for the Russian oil compared to other crude uh, and products is narrowed. So they're, they're looking at alternatives as well. Revenues, Russian revenues are down. They increased in August, but they're still down compared to a uh, year ago levels. So we can say that um, the, the price caps are working, but now with prices above that price cap, um, it remains to be seen if Russia is able to continue moving uh, the oil to markets. Uh, Troll, do you think we're headed for a diesel crisis this winter? And if yes, who will be hardest hit? 
Uh, it's something that we're seeing now. Uh, so oil prices, Brent uh, or crude prices have been increasing, but we're also seeing very, very high uh, diesel cracks. Uh, diesel cracks, the difference between diesel prices and, and crude prices are near record highs, about $50 more for diesel than, than for crude oil, which indicates to us that refiners are struggling to keep up with demand growth, especially for jet kerosene, uh, which is competing with diesel from, from refineries. Um, so, um, it, on principle, there is enough capacity to meet the demand, but it will depend on China's exports in, in months to come. We saw uh, China ref, Chinese refineries get new export quotas last month. That might help some. Uh, it will depend also on the winter weather, how much diesel and heating oil will be used for, uh, in, for, for heating in, in this winter. Um, but we're seeing now that refineries are struggling to keep up with the very uneven growth in demand, especially for distillates. So we're at risk of seeing continued tightness in the market, uh, especially for distillates in coming into the winter months. Uh, Toral, one of our main stories today is, of course, the exit of the BP chief executive and, frankly, a lot of questions on whether they'll be you know, continuing with their green efforts. Do you also see an earlier peak in oil demand than previously, and if so, when? Yes, as we noted in our medium term outlook uh, that was published just some months ago, and as our executive di director uh, said yesterday, we're seeing not only a peak in oil demand it this decade, so towards the end of the decade, but we're seeing a peak in demand for all fossil fuels uh, for the first time. So gas, coal, uh, and, and oil, all set to peak uh, this decade. It's really the, sig the significant increase in clean energy technology deployment, solar PV, uh, offshore wind coming up, but also the search in electric vehicles that we've seen in particular in China, but also in, in the European Union and the United States. So, so now we are, we have moved this peak uh, forward to the end, towards the end of this decade. But that doesn't mean that we're on track to meet our net zero by 2050 uh, mm -hmm. targets, so more efforts will be needed uh, to get on track with those uh, goals. Toral, as always, thank you so much for joining us. Toral Bozzoni there, head of the oil market division at the IEA. Coming up, Arm expects to price its IPO at the top end of its range or even higher, so we'll bring you the details. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back, everyone. Now let's take a look at some of the corporate news we're following. And Apple's latest iPhones features, well, new materials, camera upgrades, and improved performance, which the company is hoping will help pull it out of the sales slump. Now the company unveiled four new models, keeping pace with the past few generations. It's really the first significant iPhone overhaul since Apple's first 5G phones came out in 2020. Now, Apple boosted the price of one model, the top-end Pro Max, while leaving the prices of the other three new versions unchanged. It's also reported that Arm will only accept the top end of its $47 to $51 share range or more after reviewing investor commitments yesterday. Now, according to Reuters, the British ship designer owned by SoftBank decided against publishing a revised price range. The offer is actually already oversubscribed by more than 10 times. Shares, a reminder, start trading on the Nasdaq tomorrow. And finally, Birkenstock has filed for an IPO. That's another sign of the attraction that U.S. equity markets hold for European firms seeking a valuation uplift. Now, the German footwear maker, whose iconic sandals are worn by hippies and preppies alike and celebrities, will continue to be controlled by the private equity firm L. Catterton. Now, coming up, the U.S. and U.K.'s so-called special relationship. We discuss Russia's war in Ukraine, the West's policy towards China, and all of that is with the ambassador to the U.K., Jane Hartley. That's exclusive, and that's coming up next. So welcome back to The Pulse. They call it the special relationship, but ties between the United States and Britain have been under strain in recent years. Now, under the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and President Joe Biden, though there are peers to have been something of a recent reset. The UK goal of a bilateral trade agreement remains far off. Well, with me now, Jane Hartley, the US ambassador 
to the UK. Now, since arriving in London last year, she's met two monarchs and three prime ministers. We welcome also our listeners on Bloomberg Radio. Ambassador, what a great pleasure to have you here today. It's been quite a, a lot of upheaval, I would yes. say, in the UK since you've arrived. How have you been finding it? Yes. Well, I've... I've enjoyed my time here tremendously. It is interesting, though, when I came here, our political climate in the U.S., there was quite a bit of upheaval. And all of my friends that know the U.K. said, oh, you're, this is wonderful. There's going to be a lot of stability over there. Nothing like what, we're, what we were seeing in our country. So, yes, I've had three prime ministers and two monarchs and a few chancellors. Um, but what I do think is important to stress, you know, the special relationship, as we call it, um, no matter what happened politically, the relationship stayed strong. And that's because I think institutionally we are so strong together, and particularly, obviously, in terms of the military, in terms of intelligence, in terms of law enforcement, in terms of uh, rule of law and fighting for democracy around the world, which uh, the UK has done, uh, especially in terms of Ukraine. So, Great partner. And, and you spend a lot of time, I imagine, you know, showing U.S. companies, U.K. investment opportunities and vice versa. Yes. So there have been critical agreements that have been signed between the two countries. Are you optimistic about the future on, on a business front? You know, I am. Listen, in both countries, um, you know, we've seen many of the many of the same issues. Inflation, which is very sticky, both our central banks having to raise rates. Um, you know, the numbers in our country are getting, I think, a bit better, uh, unemployment quite low. Here, there may be a slight lag. Um, but overall, I think the investment climate, when you talk to CEOs that come through here, which I do often, in terms of the long term, they look at the UK as a great investment place. You know, rule of law, um, um, wonderful entrepreneurial spirit, great education. Um, so I think in the long term, uh, you would still have to put UK at the top of the list. I mean, th there's quite a lot in terms of agreements on um, critical minerals, mm -hmm. on, you know, defense. And mm -hmm. other. Does it actually end up in a trade agreement between the U.S. and the U.K.? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I do think there's a huge amount of support in Washington and even on the Hill where there has been, there have been problems with trade in the past for U.K. Um, I think that maybe given the time frame of the political calendar, probably more in our country, to be honest with you. What, if you were asking me my advice, I would look for smaller things as opposed to a grand trade deal because uh, we're going to run out of time. Uh, but I do think there are many things, and there have been many meetings that have been positive, especially on small business, uh, professional accreditation, things like that. So I think, especially given the strength of the service sector here, I think there's a lot that we could do. Is the UK government listening to US businesses that want to either increase their investment here or have more of footfall? Uh, yes, I think so. Yes, I think so. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I don't, uh, the CEOs I know that come through, um, you know, have a pretty good relationship uh, with, the, with the government here. What, what do you spend most of your time doing? I mean, we've all seen the diplomats, so I know you, you're, you're, I mean, I don't think you're, you're in the running for a vice president. It, it's, it's quite a fascinating life. Well, yeah, those that see the diplomat, my security would not allow me um, to go out and have a fight with my husband in the garden, <laughs> nor would they allow my husband to steal a police car or whatever it was. Um, you know, uh, most of my time are the, the, you know, it's the key issues. Obviously, the number one issue is Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, the UK has been a fantastic, fantastic partner in that. Um, and it's been very important to us. In many cases, even led the way on tanks and things like that. Um, so we spend a lot of time on that. Um, um, climate, where the UK has also been a real positive. I was just with President Biden when he was up with the King, his first official meeting with the King at Windsor, uh, where there was a big meeting on climate finance and getting private sector companies from both our, our countries there to commit. Um, very positive outcome. Grant Shapps and John Kerry were very involved and both did a great job. Is it, is it very significant that Rishi Sunak is not going to UNGA next week? No, I mean, I, I, I don't. I, I don't think so. I think, listen, everybody, uh, everybody has to look at their own priorities. He just came back from G20. Um, there's a lot going on domestically. Um, 
I don't think it, it's a huge issue, but you know, it's also not my. <laughs> he has his own scheduling office in number ten. It's up for them to decide. And, and he's <laughs> focusing a lot, of course, on AI. And there's a big side yes. that there's. Yes. It's really created a buzz, right, about whether the UK can be this AI hub. Yeah. Do you mm -hmm. know again how much commitment the the US will do that, or is to to this AI summit, or is it a bit too soon? Well, I know there's an AI conference. I don't have the exact dates. I think end of October, yeah. beginning of November. Um, yeah, we're we're very interested in it. And when the prime minister was over with the president. President um, talking for the Atlantic Declaration, AI came up quite often. Uh, we we want to be involved with the UK. We think, um, what you, and we're very interested. We're going to send a high-level representative mm -hmm. to this uh, conference. We don't know uh, yet who that will be, but uh, what we want to talk about is also not just the negative of AI, but the positive. You know what AI can do in education, what AI can do in health, things like that. So there's there's much that can be done but we should be discussing it globally. Ambassador, thank you so much. We'll continue the conversation with Ambassador Jane Hartley in just a moment. We'll focus on foreign policy shortly. This is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the EU has launched a probe into Chinese subsidies for electric vehicles as the bloc frets over the ability of its industry to compete. Now, this news came out about 20 minutes ago, and you're seeing uh, quite a lot of companies, including Volkswagen, gaining on the back of that. BP boss Bernard Looney quit over his failure to disclose past relationships with colleagues, leaving the oil and gas major leaderless at a crucial time. Plus, the ECB's new forecast are set to show inflation staying above 3% next year, prompting traders to lift rate hike bets. Now, key US CPI data comes out a little bit later today. But first, let's also continue the conversation with Jane Hartley, the US ambassador to the UK. And Ambassador Hartley, thank you so much for staying with us. We had a, a good conversation about the UK and the US and its mm -hmm. special relationship. If you look at foreign policy across the world, mm -hmm. there are many experts trying to understand what this meeting between Vladimir Putin and the, the leader of North Korea mm -hmm. means for security around the world? Well, I think one of the things it means is what President Biden has been saying. It's very, very important that the allies stick together as we see people that per not, perhaps are not our allies um, getting closer. And that, I think, I think that's one of the miscalculations, frankly, that Putin made going into Ukraine, which is that NATO wouldn't remain strong, that Europe would split, that um, people wouldn't be contributing on the weapons side, and the public opinion would wane. We haven't seen that. And I think that is important because we need to keep Europe close. UK, of course, has always been leading the way and continues to do that as we see these new alliances um, um, that Putin is trying to make. How do you see y Ukraine ending? So, again, it's unclear. I know we try to focus militarily mm -hmm. almost weekly what's going on, but you're also going to an election cycle in the U.S. Mm -hmm. If President Trump becomes president again, does that change everything for Ukraine? Well, listen, I think when, when people ask me how it ends, first of all, no one knows how it ends, yeah. but uh, Tony Blinken always makes the comment, our Secretary of State, it would end tomorrow if Russia stopped. Russia is the aggressor. aggressor. Russia is the one that invaded Ukraine. Ukraine was a democracy sitting there peacefully, go, people going to work every day, kids going to school every day. So if Russia stopped their aggression, it would end. Uh, other than that, I don't know. You know, I know that um, many of our allies and we too are providing new weapon systems to Ukraine. And, you know, one thing I will say, that the, the bravery of the Ukrainian people, I went up to, I, I down, I always get the geography, to Lid here with the uh, UK's training, the, the Ukrainian uh, troops to go into battle. Uh, five week training, and then these people are on the battlefield. And they're all volunteers, volunteers from all works of, of walks of life. You know, bartenders and accountants and lawyers and taxi drivers and, you know, five weeks there and then they're, they're fighting for their country and, and maybe losing their lives. So that we can never forget, I think. And that, I think, is critically important. And I, I commend especially the UK for their strength in terms of what they're doing, in terms of supporting uh, the people of Ukraine. Can China be part of the solution for Ukraine? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I would hope so. I would hope so. You know, anybody, I think, that could 
uh, once again, bring people together, sit at a table, um, because the, the, the tragedy of Ukraine, when you look at these cities that are bombed to death, these were thriving metropolitan areas, it's just, it's heartbreaking. But once again, we can't ever forget that, that Russia and Putin are the aggressor. People were just living their lives peacefully. Um, so I would hope, I would hope for the sake of everybody it could be brought to a close, but right now uh, I, don't, I don't see a path at the moment. Ambassador, what, what's the best way to deal with China? So President Biden is, is trying to have a one-on-one -on -one with President Xi. Mm -hmm. Should the UK Prime Minister try and do the same? Well, listen, I think Secretary, Secretary Cleverly was just over there, and um, we've had many cabinet people over there. As you know, Gina Raimondo, our Secretary of Commerce, just came back. Janet Yellen was there before, Tony Blinken before that. Um, I think the point we keep making is we're not going to decouple from China. China's going to play an important role in many macro issues, climate being one, very important one. Um, but we are going to de-risk from China. And I think that's what the conversation is. I think our eyes are wide open, mm -hmm. as are the UK's. Um, so we have to figure out how to keep a dialogue going, understanding that it is a different world than it was 10 years ago. So again, it's difficult. What does that look like for businesses? It seems like sometimes the, the politics gets muddled with the economics, with retaliations mm -hmm. you know, against certain companies. Well, I think for business, I, I, I mean, I've talked to a lot of CEOs, and I think they are um, happy with the communication. And once again, I, I think we've had more cabinet people in China over the last few months than almost any place else. Sure. And there, there is a lot of communication. And, you know, I think Gina, Gina Romanto says it well. Once again, uh, decouple, uh, but, you know, um, not decouple, but de-risk. But also our businesses in China have to be treated better. Um, and, and that is something we're watching. And then obviously in things like sensitive technologies, um, we, we probably are going to be a little stricter on where investment goes. So we're into an election cycle in the U.S. How mm -hmm. many questions do you have to field <laughs> from people that come and see, from politicians, frankly, all across the world that tell you what will happen in the election and what will you <laughs> tell them? <laughs> well, <laughs> many questions almost every day these days. Um, what I tell them, there are certain certainties. Uh, President Biden will be the Democratic nominee, that is for sure. Um, President Biden will be running on a strong platform. Um, and especially, I think, if you look at the economy and some of what he's done, whether it's IRA or whether, you know, um, much of his chip, the CHIPS legislation, other things. I mean, we're, we're, even though we, have, too, have seen inflation in our country, it looks like it's going down. The Fed is obviously still watching it. Unemployment's low. I think he's going to run on a strong, strong platform. Um, so that I know. On the Republican side, who knows? <laughs> What do, do the U.S. voters want? I mean, again, it seems in the polls, yeah. President Biden has done a lot. It doesn't always translate yeah. In, yeah. into voter perception. Listen, I think with the economy, I think, as you know better than anybody, there, there's always a lag. So um, I do think the economy is important. I mean, we remember, or I remember, I'm so old, I guess, I remember the... Clinton campaign when James Carville coined, it's the economy stupid. Um, I think it's still the economy stupid. I mean, I think it's not just the economy. It's support for democracy. It's support for the right social values. And, you know, I do think the Biden administration has all of that. But the economy is going to be important. And I think what, we see, what we've seen in terms of some legislation the president has enacted, which is also very hard in a 50-50 Senate, um, and where the economy is heading, you know, I think President Biden is running for this term because he thinks he wants to finish the job. That's what he says. Um, and I think the, the, the public knows that, and I think we'll, we'll feel that. And also, I think in terms of, value, you know, democratic values and social values, too, um, uh, President Biden's more in line with the majority of American people. Ambassador, thank you so much for taking the time to, <laughs> to come on with us today. That was Jane Hartley, the U.S. ambassador to the court of St. James. Now coming up, luxury shares have underperformed over the past month, weighed down by China's slowing economy. But Swiss watchmaker Audemars Piguet says it expects to end this year with record sales. So we'll be speaking exclusively to the company's chief executive next. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to The Pulse, everyone. Now, Audemars Piguet says sales are headed for another record this year with demand staying strong. A member of what's known as the holy trinity of Swiss watchmakers, which includes Patek Philippe and Vacheron Constantin, the average price for an Audemars Piguet timepiece is about 50,000 euros. Now, the chief executive officer, François-Henri Bename, a former professional golfer as well, has spent 30 years at the firm, a decade of which he was chief executive. Now, another record sales result would cap that run as he looks to step down at the end of the year. And he joins me now. Thank you for joining us. I mean, you're kind of going from strength to strength in terms of the luxury, you know, the, the luxury watchmaking industry. Have you seen any difference in price points and demand in the type of models that people want since last year? First of all, I think that over the last 20 years, what we've seen is a change in education about watchmaking. If in New York in 2000, I would have asked someone in the streets on, you know, on Madison Avenue, uh, what would the price of an expensive watch, people would have, might have said 1,000 or 2,000. No. Today, we, if you ask the same question 20 years later, people would say half a million or a million. So there has been a lot of education towards watchmaking. Mm -hmm. And today, because of that, people are getting more and more uh, involved and want to get things done for themselves. Which is quite strange. I mean, you look, you know, the, some of the Apple watches and things like that are really taking over our lives. So do you see it bifurcating? The ones that really love these beautiful timepieces and frankly can also afford them will buy more and more. And that w is what drives demand going forward. So the funny thing is when the Apple Watch came out, the press worldwide came to us and said, you guys are dying, correct? Apple is taking over. You're dead. Die. Die right now. And Wait, when so, was this? That was, what, 2006, 2007, when you came out? Yeah. The funny thing is, what we saw coming, it's a generation that was never supposed to either wear a watch or that would wear a smartwatch, the younger generation, came to the understanding of that watchmaking was pretty much cool, yeah. and they started to educate, to educate the parents and brought them to our world. So the funny thing is, we've seen a rise in an arrival of a young clientele towards fine watchmaking in the last five, six years that has changed the game completely. And that is a great open door for the future. So you're still a small, very high-end, right, uh, luxury watchmaker. You're increasing production. Is there a sweet spot where you worry that if you increase too much, then you become, I, I guess, too, too available? Okay, so let's look at it with a number. It's 50,000 watches. So this year it's going to be 52,000 watches. Okay. Next year it's going to be 53,000 watches. We are not playing with production. We have our constraints. We cannot just, oh, overnight we're going to increase by 10,000 watches. And it wouldn't make any sense. So we've made a very serious point of keeping and staying true to who we are and making the watches the same way we are making them years and years ago. So we'll never be able to go crazy numbers. And if at some point there was a need to say, we need to slow down, then we would slow down. We're not a public right. company, so we're pretty much doing whatever we want. Which is a beautiful place to be. I mm. know that some of your iconic watches, the 11.59, I don't know how, how big you want that to be. I mean, one of the things that if, you're, if you were to list or to sell, investors will say, well, you have three, four iconic products, and, and they really drive everything. Is that a good or a bad thing? It depends, because you, it's, you were always the pros and cons of being actually owned or being a public company. I do believe that being privately owned has a real, real added value in today's world because we can really adjust to our needs and never be pushed in any way, shape or form to the direction that we wouldn't want to be involved with. So what does that mean in terms of pricing? Is the sky the limit? No, there is a limit, but there is a limit also delivered by our own production system. What we can do, if we develop a new mechanism, we have... Okay, so we target, let's say, women for the next 10 years, or we target very high-end, complicated mechanisms, or we go for an, a new line that we could launch that have, yeah. you see, different implications, and you've got to get the prices. We know for a fact that we're going to slowly but surely increase our average price worldwide from 50 to, again, 52, 53, okay. but over the course of five, six years. So, so how do you stay relevant? I don't, you know, you've made a success of this. You're one of the most recognized chief executive in this space. Mm -hmm. What questions do you ask yourself? I know there's also a lot of talk about collaborations that have done really well, and that's the way the luxury space is going towards. Be curious and listen to what's going on in the world on a regular basis, because what was right yesterday is not a confirmation that it's going to be right for the next 10, 20, or 30 years. So you need to pay attention to what the world is about. 
You need to listen to the younger generations. What do they want? How do they perceive launches, not only in the luxury world, also in the mass market business? So be curious and see what's happening. But how? Everybody wants to be curious and understand, especially the, the younger consumers. It's easier said than done, frankly. Um, I don't think so. I pay a lot of attention with the younger generation working for the Marpigue. So I'm being told by them a lot of things, by my own kids, but also when I go outside to the people who are working with our clients sometimes, who could be athletes, they could be contemporary art people, they could be people from the world of sports, and we take a lot of things from them. What would be your, your dream collaboration that you haven't managed? I won't tell you do. this. <laughs> what do you think? You're going to get me to tell you everything today? It's, it's just between us. Uh, no, it's no, not. no one else is yeah, listening. Good luck with that. Give me, give me a sense of what the main challenge actually for your successor is at Eau de Mars. The main challenge is to keep building on what we've built, which is not such a challenge because we are not running the business by hit and runs. It's very stable. I mean, when I came to Odomar Piguet in 1994, the brand was doing less than 100 million in revenue. So yes, over the course of 29 years, it has evolved a lot. But as I said, we're still in La Brasserie. We still make a very small amount of watches for the world. We still use very high-skilled watchmakers, men and women. And we have a plan to stay that way for the many, many years to come. There is no diversification planned. We're not going to different fields. So it's pretty much a challenge, but a, not a tough one in that respect. But what's the section of tomorrow? So I know it's, a, it's the young kids, but is it women or women buying women. more of I their would say women. Women. We, women is the next big thing because watchmaking as a perception is men, with the exception of a few companies, but it's pretty much men. And we st start to see also an ar a rise of women coming to watchmaking and say, I love mechanism, I love these complicated things. And this is where we have to do a lot of things because we've basically didn't pay as much attention as we should have. I, I feel like th this was maybe what jewelry in general went through like maybe 10 years ago, right? And, and also more women buy for themselves. Mm -hmm. Do you sell to women differently? Do you do to men? It depends. You know, I, you cannot put, you cannot Categories. check those boxes, categorize this way because it's, it's, it's not one size fits all. And it depends really. But to give you an example, too many times when a couple comes to a store and if it's for the men, we won't actually do anything with the woman, which is a big mistake. So I, I, this is my theo theory of the dead bodies. And you need to basically bring them into our world by doing what, for example? Oh, we just got that new thing. Give me your advice. I need your help. Are we on the right direction? Just by saying yeah. this could help actually open the doors of a discussion. And what we are seeing is this is coming unexpected somehow. We don't always plan the success. Um, Francois, what do you think makes your success? So is it, you know, I know you said in the past that the bonne humeur is important in the office. Is it leadership, your style of leadership, or is it ideas? It's a mix of everything because when, when you are successful today, it comes from different angles. But I always say we are a very serious brand, but we don't take ourselves seriously. And our clients know that. Don't forget also, we are one of the few brands that decided, that decided to consolidate our distribution network over the last 10 years. So now we interact with end consumers, with the clients, men, women, young, older, and we've learned so much. And by learning, being with them on a regular basis, then we say, okay, so now we could really understand much more what's at stake and how we could involve them in helping growing the business. Would it um, ever make sense for AP Watches to buy a distributor? Uh, not at all. You are referring to something that happened recently in our, in our category? In your, I mean, there, there's certainly been some M&A. Sure. Right? And I don't know whether that changes anything for, for us, no. Because we've already pretty much consolidated our entire distribution network. So we are in control of our retail operations. We don't need to buy a third party okay. to be able to sell our watches. But do you think there's a consolidation coming in, in, in the watchmaking business? At every level, from the supplier standpoint to the retailer standpoint, absolutely, sure. And, and so what does that mean? Is it, is it margin focused? Is it just streamlined? Does it mean that some I don't think that won't survive? The world we're living in, you need to understand who your clients are. And to understand it, you cannot have too many people in between. 
you really need to get access to that. And not just for pure data, is really to be able to know, are we doing good? Are we doing bad? What do we have to correct? What do we have to adjust? You will never get those informations if you have some people in between. So to go directly from the bench of the watchmaker yeah. to the end consumer is okay. the best possible school to learn of what's going to come next. What are you doing next? That's a good question. Thank you for asking. Anything else? So you'll come back and tell me next time. Francois, thank you so much. You're welcome. For, unless you want to tell me breaking news now. Uh, no, there's Which no breaking news today. <laughs> Francois-Henri Benamias, uh, their chief executive of Audemars. Piguet joining us with an exclusive conversation on uh, the luxury watch industry. Now, coming up, we've also had news overnight that the ECB sees euro area inflation remaining above 3% next year. So more on what that means for the central bank's rate path ahead. That's next. And this is Bloomberg. Welcome back, everyone. So U.S. CPI data due later today, the ECB's decision tomorrow. So let's get more with our markets reporter, Valerie Titel. So, Val, how could the ECB's inflation forecast actually play into tomorrow's meeting? Uh, well, we get their updated macroeconomic projections alongside the ECB decision tomorrow, and they use this to basically paint a picture to the market about how they're thinking. And if they're thinking that inflation does need to be revised higher, especially in 2024, which, as those reports suggest, that does imply there is more work to do on hiking. And exactly to that point, we've seen ECB hike expectations jump now uh, uh, at 65 percent, Francine, for the decision in two days' time. So what can we also expect from U.S. CPI data later? Uh, the U.S. CPI data is going to be a big one uh, for the direction for the Fed. We are uh, likely to see a tick up in headline uh, CPI, but the real drama for the markets and the Fed is going to be in this core number. The core number is expected to come in at 0.2 month on month. That would be a third month in a row we get that kind of reading. And Francine, that is important because it is in line with the Fed's 2% target if you do annualize that month on month 0.2% print. There are some speculations out there. We could get a hotter than expected core number today. So keep uh, an eye out when that data does drop at 1.30 p.m. UK time. Valerie, thank you so much for Valerie Titel there with the very latest on ECB and U.S. CPI. One thing we also need to mention is the U.K. economy shrinking at the fastest pace in seven months in July. Again, uh, this comes as we had a lot of strikes in that period, but also wet weather hit activity Harder than expected. That's probably reviving a little bit of concern about a recession possibly being underway. GDP slipping 0.5% following a 0.5% gain in June. This is Bloomberg.